Hi, I'm Nate Seberg, and this is One Day Ahead. Welcome to the Teaching Romeo and Juliet video series. This is the third episode in this series, and here we are going to talk about teaching the prologue and what you can do to set yourself up for success. The first few episodes in this series are available totally free, and the rest you can find at onedayahead.com. Along with my Romeo and Juliet summary and analysis series, which is a whole other thing, teaching materials, and a whole bunch more. And with that, it's time for a little ancient grudge, new mutiny, because it's time to dive into teaching Romeo and Juliet prologue. So this video is about teaching the prologue. If you want to walk through the prologue itself, line by line, I got that video. It's in the Romeo and Juliet summary and analysis series, and it's good. So I haven't actually written it yet, but by the time you see this, it'll be, I'm sure it was funny. It is funny, it will be funny. So budget-wise, this prologue is probably a day which is a big investment considering it's only 14 lines. I will generally combine work on the prologue with the tail end of the finding your relevance assignment mentioned in the last video, uh, giving people some time to encounter the language and consider what we have covered so far before they respond. The prologue is weird for kids because we don't really have an analog in popular culture. You'll need to explain what the word chorus means. Basically, before the play starts, all the actors walk out on stage and say, this is exactly what is about to happen. They cared consistently considerably less about spoilers than we do. So start your lesson this day with an entry task about star-crossed lovers. Check out the teaching unit for uh, the files. I have students write about their associations with this term. Maybe name a few lovers from movies, then I move them into the actual lines. How you do it will depend on your kids, but I have them read it alone first. The only time in the entire play I'm going to have them do that. Then they get into small groups to try to go for a line-by-line -line direct translation. Again, the files are in the unit. I end up walking around in whack a mole phrases like civil blood, fatal loins, or whatever. After they get a handle on the meaning of these 14 lines, I use the prologue as an excuse to teach them iambic pentameter. I use quite an excellent animated TED video for this, and I, I give you that link in the unit. I really don't do much with this beyond saying, like, isn't that cool? I want them to get it, I want them to feel it, but I don't have kids try to, like, replicate it or anything. I've seen that tried, but I've never seen it go well. With that done, I bring them back to the concept of star-crossed lovers. Ultimately, I'm steering them toward the cultural association that we have with fate and stars, that our destiny is written in the stars, that it's unchangeable and constant. So for Romeo and Juliet to be star-crossed, it means quite literally against the stars. They scream in the face of their destiny, and that defiance will end in their deaths. Fate is going to come crashing down on them, and it will be to their detriment. But also notice here how the existence of the prologue itself creates a sort of fate for the audience too. Shakespeare doesn't leave us in suspense. We are not left wondering if these two crazy kids are gonna make it. There is no hope, no expectation of a last second deliverance, no plot twist, no help from above. This is a long, slow march down, down, down. We are promised a train wreck. That is what we are watching, and it will be two hours before they jump the track. And that's teaching the Romeo and Juliet prologue. Thank you for watching. You can check out all my stuff, including this whole series on onedayahead.com. Next episode, we head to Romeo and Juliet, act one. We'll see you next time on One Day Ahead.